Hey guys, what's up? Hello. Hi. Hey. I would say I would say uh, I really uh, looking forward for this uh, talk because it's really uh, my problem because I really the fan of the refactoring and I had uh, the talk about it in Russia a couple of years ago. That is why it's really interesting. Every time we have to manually do one refactor, some part of me dies inside. So I guess we can automate that thanks to Nicola's amazing talk. Well, hoping that it works for everyone. So I think it's time to start. Guys, could you please show us the slides? Let's go. Hey, uh, so hi everyone and thanks for coming to my talk today. Uh, I will show you a different usage of Babel. Uh, I'm Nicola and I have been part of the Babel team for a few years now. If you want to ask me anything, even after this talk or anything related to Babel, you can contact me either on Twitter or by email. Uh, okay, so, well, let's start. What is Babel? Probably many of you already know, it's a JavaScript compiler. Uh, so it, it, get, it gets some, input, some JavaScript code as the input and it produces some JavaScript code as the output. Uh, but, well, I already talked exactly about how it does this in my last talk here. So if you're interested, you can check it on, on, on the YouTube channel of this conference. I'm going to follow a different uh, route now. So Babel is a customizable JavaScript compiler. And, well, what can it do? Well, the obvious thing is compiling ECMAScript syntax to older to older syntax so that it can work in older browsers and it can compile TypeScript flow in JSX to plain JavaScript. Also, you could try building a minifier for your code and we actually tried doing that and we had a project called Babel Minifier. You can also use that to statically evaluate parts of your program, for example, using Babel macros. Or you can perform static analysis on your code, for example, to check how often do you use some given patterns. Or you can use it to run one-time transforms and automate refactorings. And this is what I'm going to focus on now. So what are code demos? Well, they are tools or programs that let you run these one-time transforms. Uh, and why do we need that? Well, our factors happen, we all know. And sometimes they're self-contained without impacting parts of your program. And they may take just a few hours, so it's okay to do that manually. Sometimes they affect the work base and they could take a few days. Or you might need to introduce changes across different applications maintained by your company. And this could take weeks. And in some very large companies, those changes across the whole infrastructure might even take a few months. And well, sometimes you maintain a popular open source library that is used by many users outside of your company. And I mean, I do not even know how long it would take to update all the projects using your library. And this is why we can use Codemics. Well, I'm now going to show you not what you can use them for, because it's almost everything, every factor that you might want to automate. But we use them for a few things in Bubble. For example, we use them to migrate our tests to Jest, uh, or to remove some un unused catch bindings when upgrading our, our supported JavaScript versions, or to remove a resolve dependency. Uh, replacing it with the native required to resolve function in Node.js. And we are now using them to migrate our wall monorepo from Flow to TypeScript. And well, also what other companies use them for. For example, Facebook publishes codemods to migrate away from legacy React versions, or Gatsby provide codemods for well, doing the similar thing. And also Next.js provides code demos to upgrade from old features to new features. Okay, so 
How are codemods different from normal compilers? Because usually Bubble is thought of as, as a JavaScript compiler. Well, compilers are based on strictly defined semantics that you can find, in this case, in the JavaScript specification. Uh, so, for example, they take some input code and they produce some, well, I'd say strange output code that exactly reflects the semantics of the original code. On the other hand, codemods are based on assumptions about your coding style. So, if, for example, you have this input code, we are doing uh, person and person.address.city and, and so on, a codemod could convert it to this new modern syntax using optional chain, even if it's not exactly the same thing. Uh, for example, it will break if you, post, if you pass false, because it will, it, will, it will get address from false, this returns undefined, and then you cannot get city from that. But if you assume that you're using this end-end pattern exactly to represent what usually optional chain does, you could build this codemo to, to upgrade your code base. Also, compilers need to be precise and they cannot fail because developers should be able to trust what the compiler does, what Babel does, without checking the output every time. Otherwise, after running a single build, you would every time have to check that the code generated is still correct. On the other hand, codemods, well, it's okay if they work in most cases, but even if sometimes they do not work, it's still okay because you only run them once, so you can uh, fix the code generated by Codemod in case they, 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 they do something wrong. So why can't we just create the perfect Codemod so that we never have to manually check uh, what it does? Well, I found this, this image on XKCD, and I think that it really reflects why we shouldn't create the perfect codemod. So if we have to refactor some code, we could just do that and it will take some time. Or we could try working on a codemod so that we need first of all to focus on building the codemod and then the, the refactor happens automatically. In practice, if you're trying to build a perfect codemod, it probably would take so much time that it's not worth building it. For example, if you are building a codemod to convert CommonJS modules to ECMAScript modules, well, it's easy, for example, to transform, well, maybe not easy, but it's quite obvious to transform this code to this code. It's exactly the same thing. And we can also convert, for example, if we are exporting a function here, we can convert that to an export declaration using native modules. But what, if, what we, if we are doing something like this? In this case, our codemod would have to statically evaluate fs.write.name to know that it, it can be replaced by the string write so that the, the resulting name of this export is write local. And well, I'm not even sure how I could write a codemod to do so. And the best thing to do in these cases is to just bail out. So a codemod could, for example, uh, generate some code like this, where it just says unknown. And then when I review the output code, I can manually fix that. Or a codemod could, for example, add a comment saying this hasn't been transformed or something similar. So that then the developer using the codemod can easily find where the codemod didn't, didn't fully transform the input code. And for this reason, we, we need to run codemod using something like Git or similar versioning systems so that we can then easily review its changes. Okay, so I'm going to show how to use Babel to build a codemod, but it's not the only possible tool. Uh, well, the first alternative is regular expressions. And they're really good for some very, very small refactors. For example, if I have somewhere uh, a token in my code, I might want to replace it with a, different with a different access token. And I can just use a regular expression to search and replace across the whole code base. But when things get a bit more complex, it's really hard to build a 
a work in regular expressions for big portions of code. So we can use JS code shift, which is the most popular tool to build JavaScript code demos. And it provides a jQuery-like API to navigate the AST. It includes different tools, such as Babel Parser for parsing the input code or Recast for printing the output code. And it can be used with any AST transform tool that you like. You can also use JS code shift with Codemots built using Bubble. So it's not really an alternative, it's something that you can use at the same time as Bubble. And well, why did I choose Bubble? Well, it provides a massive set of built in utilities to analyze the ASD and the scope. So you can get, for example, all the variables defined inside of a given function and transform the code based on this, or there are really a lot of utilities. Also, you can reuse the same knowledge to modify your build process with, with custom plugins. So, well, this is because code emotes created using Bubble are really normal Bubble plugins. So you don't need to learn anything new. Okay. I guess we can see an example now. Uh, I'm going to show you how to build a code demo to transform React class components to functions with hooks. But, well, before starting... Okay, React class components are still supported and will not go away soon. This means that you do not need to actually build something like this. Do not worry if you're using class components in React. They are still good. They will be good for a long time. So this is just an example of how you could build a code demo, but you do not actually need to, to run something like this on your code base. And this is just an example of what our codemod will do. So it takes a class component and it generates the really similar components using, for example, the use state hook or inline the variables inside of the, of the function component. Okay. So in order to do this, we will uh, use a tool called AST Explorer. And AST Explorer is a playground that helps us developing Babel plugins. And this is because it has different uh, sections uh, on the page where you can write the input code, see the corresponding AST, which is the, the structure representing the, the input code, and Babel plugins work by transforming this AST. Then you can write a custom Babel plugin and you can see the generated code on the bottom right. And I really like building plugins on AST Explorer because it automatically runs the plugin every time you change that. So you can see in real time what your plugin is doing to the input code. Okay, so what are the steps that we will follow to build this code demo? Well, first we will have to detect React class components because we do not want to transform any class but just React classes. And this is probably the easiest thing to do. Then we will transform components sub containing only the render method to, to function expressions. Then we will add support for props. We will add support for state. And at this point, we will take a short, well, a break from the example, and we will see how we can avoid adding support for something. Again, because it might it might not be worth it. It might take too much time compared to how much time it saves us. And we will see how to uh, build something, still using Bubble, to check if we need to implement support for, for a given pattern or feature or not. Then we will add support for, for class fields. And finally, we will inject imports to the new hooks that we're using in our files. Uh, before actually building the code demo, we will we first need to understand what is the anatomy of a Babel plugin. And well, Babel plugins are normal functions that take uh, a single parameter containing different utilities from Babel, such as Babel types that we can use to, to check the type of, of a given AST node or to build new AST nodes, and Babel template that we can use to to build new pieces of code to inject in the final result. 
Uh, then we can define all the helper functions to analyze or transform our code inside of this bit plugin function so that we can use Babel types or Babel template. And then we must return a visitor containing uh, something similar to an event listener for every AST node that we want to handle. And we will see this more in the tile while building the code mode. Okay, so let's move to the first step, which is detecting a React class component. So if we have this input code, what what kind what AST are we looking for to be sure that it is a React component? Uh, you can try writing this input code on AST Explorer, and you will see that the corresponding AST is this one on the right. So we have a class declaration with a superclass, which is a member expression. Uh, getting the component property from the React object. And how do we build this in the code, in our plugin code? Uh, well, first, we are looking for a class declaration. So you can add, add a visitor for class declarations. And these visitors take a path argument which uh, that gives us access to the ST node using path.node and it gives us a bunch of other utilities. Uh, so now we have a class, a class declaration and we need to check if we have a React component. And if we do not, we can just return so that we do not transform it. And how do we build this is React component function? Well, we can use one of the numerous utilities that Babel gives us. In this case, it's matches pattern where we can check if a given AST node, in this case, node.superclass, corresponds to the react.component member expression. Okay, so we now have detected that we are, we are transforming a React component. And we can start adding support for the render method. So suppose we have this input code, uh, in this case, I wrote extends component. It should have been extends react.component. Uh, but suppose that we have this input code with, with a React component with a single render method. And again, we can check on AST Explorer what is the corresponding AST shape. And we now can build a new utility function to find the render method in our class. So we have the class declaration node, which is pet.node. And we need to get the, the body of the body of the class declaration. And we're using body.body .body here because uh, not.body, where not is the class declaration, is a class body component. And then its body, it's an array containing all the elements inside of the class. So we can now look for the, for the class element, which is a class method. And we can use Babel types for this. For every possible AST node, Babel types gives us an is something function to check if we, are, if we have the AST node we are looking for. So we check if we have a class method, which is neither static nor computed. And then we check if the key of this class method matches the name of the method we are looking for. In this case, it will check if the key of this method is an identifier whose name is render. And then we can return the body of the function. Uh, I'm just returning the body and not the world method because for our code mode, we just need the body. And again, you can see that we're doing dot body dot body because the body is, a, is another AST node and then its body is an array containing all its elements. Okay, and we can now use this find method uh, function that we created. You can see here that I'm calling the path.replace with, and this is how we can replace an existing node with another one. And I'm using Babel template to build the to build the output code. So we are building a constant whose name is the original ID of the class, and this a uh, constant is a function that takes some props as input, and the body of this, of this function is the old body of the render method. And so you can see that if we now have this input code I showed you before, 
it generates this corresponding output code. So, well, our codemo is working now in this really simple, simple case. Um, well, let's move to the next steps to make it a bit more complex. The next step was rewriting this props usage. So again, we can write on AST Explorer the input code we are interested in. And we can see which is the corresponding AST. We can see that this .props.name is represented as a member expression whose object is another, is another member expression getting the props property from an AST node whose type is this expression. And then the, the outer member expression has a property who, uh, which is an identifier whose name is name in this case. However, while building this code demo, I realized that we do not need all of this. We can just look for this props. And this is because if we get a props parameter uh, in our arrow function, we just need to replace this props with the props parameter. So we can build another utility function. And you can notice that here it's taking a path as a parameter and not an AST node. And this is because uh, if you want to mutate the AST, you should always use paths because they give you a lot of utilities to do so rather than directly interacting with the AST nodes. So the difference uh, from the previous step was that re the render method was a dear children of our React class. While uh, this dot props could be used anywhere deep inside of our React component. So we need to spawn a nested traversal looking for member expression nodes. So we are passing a new type of visitors and Bubble will check all the nested children of our class and fire this visitor for every member expression. So we can start by extracting the node from our path so that we are working with the ST node for the member expression. We can check that the node is not computed and that the, the object of the member expression is this and that the property is props. And if we have this expression, we can replace this uh, member expression with just props, which is the identifier referring to the parameter of our arrow function. So we can now use this new utility in our class declaration visitor, and our code demo will now transform this input code, which was what we were studying now, to this. So as you can see, it's getting props.name from the props parameter. So, well, this is starting to, be, to get powerful. It still cannot represent components with state, but it can now transform every component whose, whose result is only computed depending on the, on the input properties. And, well, let's move to the next step. So, how can we convert uh, the state to use state hooks? And, well, this is probably a bit more complex because we need to transform different things. Uh, so first we have to transform the, the state declaration and then we have to transform the usage of state and then also the state could be updated. So we also have to transform these dot set state codes. But well, let's start from the first step. So let's focus only on the state declaration now. And for this code demo, I'm supposing that we are using state as a class property and not inside of the constructor. But this is just an assumption about my code base. For your own code base, you, you could have different assumptions. You could define state inside of the constructor. So let's move again to AST Explorer and let's see which is the AST corresponding to our, to our declaration. Uh, well, we are now looking for a, well, we are now looking for a class property inside of the body, and the value of this class property is an object expression that has a bunch of properties. Uh, so, for example, uh, here we have a single property whose key is an identifier whose name is count, and then it has some value which is a numeric literal node. Okay, 
So we can build a find field function to first get the, the state property from our class. And I didn't uh, show this one step by step because it's almost the same as the find method function we built before for the render method. So it's iterating over the elements of the body of our class. It's checking if we have a class property which is neither static, neither computed. And it's then checking uh, if its key is what we're looking for. And this find field function returns the value of our property. So it just returns the object expression for our state. Uh, then, uh, since this transform is more complex, it's, it depends, uh, like places, for example, the state declaration can affect how other pieces of the render method must be transformed. So we need to somehow collect some data about our state. And I decided to build a map, mapping from the name of our state variable to, to a getter and setter that we can use uh, for the hook. So for example, we have count and set count returned by use state and then to the initial value. So in order to do this, we need another helper function. Uh, for example, find initial state. And this starts by finding the, the object representing the initial values of the state. And then it iterates over all the properties. It extracts the, the name and the value, and it defines, it puts uh, the getter setter and initial value into this state map that we're building. Uh, and then we can, well, we can use this new utility in our in our main transform, so inside of the class declaration uh, visitor. So we get the initial state and we iterate over this map to build the use state calls. And this is why I needed a get and a set name for each piece of state, because those are the two values returned by use state. So we build all of our use state calls and we can then use them in the in the generated code inside of our arrow function. So our code demo now will transform this input code to this output code. And I mean, it's working in this case. So you can see that we, we analyzed the state object. We noticed that it had a count property and we built the new const count set count equals to use state zero where zero is the value we get from the, from the value inside the original object. And I didn't build, I didn't show in the slides all the code to transform also this.state.count to just count, because it's almost the same uh, as what we did for transforming properties. But I will give you a link with, to the whole code demo in case you're interested in seeing the, the whole code. And also, I didn't build the. Uh, I did, I'm not showing now how we can transform these dot set state calls, but again, it's really similar. We we need to spawn a nested traversal looking for call expressions, and we need to check that those call expressions are uh, calling the this dot set state helper. Then we need to take the object that we're giving it as a parameter and using that to to build calls to, for example, set count in this case. Okay, so we've now seen a bit of uh, examples of different steps that we needed to build in our code demo. And we can now take a small break from building that to focus a bit on what we're doing. And so does our code demo cover every case? Because in the example I showed you, well, it was always working but those were really, really simple examples. So what can we do with more complex examples? Well, we could decide to not support them. And again, this is because of the, of the reason I explained with that image where it's better not to spend an infinite amount of time building something where we could do that manually in a shorter amount of time. For example, if our React class had some complex state, 
uh, for example, well, this is, if we have this simple state, it just works. But what if we have some more complex expression? For example, if our initial state is not a simple object, but it's calling a function to get its first, its initial value from somewhere else, or if it's doing some complex thing to compute the initial state. What can we transform this to? Well, we can decide not to support it. And so in our codemo, if we do not if we don't have the object expression we are looking for, we can decide to just add a comment saying that our codemo is not able to refactor this complex state and just return and not transform it. So that when reviewing the the codemo output, we can see that there is a warning comment and we can manually fix it. For example, in this case, maybe we would need to use a use reducer, use reducer hook. So our input code would then be transformed to something like this, rather than transforming the, the component. And I mean, this is okay, because probably just a very little number of classes in our code base are using this. So again, we are okay with fixing that manually. Also, we could decide to analyze a pattern's frequency because there might be some React feature that we do not know how much our code base is using. So we do not know if it's worth to implement that in the code input. For example, default props. Uh, well, we can build a new Bibble plugin that checks uh, all of our React components and counts how many of them are using the default props. So we start with a new plugin, uh, getting the bubble utilities and returning the visitor. We look for only for classes. And specifically, we are only interested in React classes because we want to know how much of them are using the default props. So we can count your classes and then we can, oh, sorry, that's my dog. And then we can, we can check if they have a default props field and if they, if they do, we can increment some given counter. Then we can run our plugin on, on all of our files in our code demo using the direct Babel API. And after running it on all the files, we can, we can just output how many of them are using, in this case, default props. So if, for example, only five out of more than 100 are using default props, it's probably not worth to implement that. If it's just five classes, we can refactor them manually. Okay, so we now have run some stats on our code. And in this case, we have decided that we did not need to implement support for default props. But let's go back to our code demo. And let's suppose that we have run some analysis and we have found that we almost never use class methods, but only use our own functions for, for declaring functions that we will use in our class. So, we want to transform those uh, class fields, especially containing our functions, but we can transform any class field to, the, to something that works with normal class components. So we will need to inline those class fields as, norm, as normal variables. So let's check again on AST Explorer, uh, what is the AST corresponding to our input code. In this case, we're looking for a class property similarly to what we were looking for when looking for the state. But now we have to get all the class properties in our class rather than looking for a specific one. So we can then build a map similarly to what we did before, uh, but ignoring state because we do not want to inline state as a normal variable. We already want to handle them it using use state hooks. So we can build another helper function. For example, I called it find class properties that takes the class AST node as input and iterates on the class body. It checks if we have a property which is neither computed, neither static. Uh, 
and the, it then checks that the property's name is not state, and then it adds this property to the to our map. And it will probably be a good idea if we have a computed or a static property. Uh, in this case, I'm just ignoring it, but it could be a good idea uh, to emit a warning comment in the in the output code so that I can then see when reviewing the code that our codemo didn't handle everything. So we can now use this new utility that we just built in our class declaration visitor. Uh, we had this map uh, from class properties to their initial value. And we can, uh, well, get this map. And again, similar to what we did with use state, we can iterate over all the properties build using Babel template the corresponding uh, const declaration and then inject those new declarations inside of the body of our resulting arrow function. So if we now have this input code, it can be transformed to something like this. Uh, the state transformation is what we already had before, but we're now inlining this ink property as a normal variable. And you can see that when working with Babel, we do not have to usually worry about conflicts between different uh, transformations. So in this case, even if the state is inside of the property, since we are always working with the work class, both of the transformations will, will run on this code and they will both transform the this.state call and the ink property. And well, this is almost correct. There is still a problem, which is that we are still using this.ink and we should replace this with a normal reference to the ink variable now. So let's check again on AST Explorer what is the AST corresponding to this prop to this this dot ink code. And again, it's a member expression whose object is a this expression and with a property. So we can create a, a new function, rewrite verse usage, which again it's similar to what we did with when converting props, uh, and it's almost the same of what we would need to do to convert this dot state dot something usages. And we have to traverse our class looking for member expressions. We then check if we are, I mean, in this case, I'm bailing out if the object is not in this expression or if the property is computed. Then we can get the name of the property and we only want to transform that if it's a known class property. And again, I'm just returning here, but probably it would be a good idea to inject a warning comment. And then at the end, I'm replacing this, uh, this dot something member expression with just an identifier. So now our transform transforms this, this dot ink inside of the on click property on click uh, attribute to just a reference to the ink variable. Okay, so we can move to the last step of our code demo, which is injecting imports for used hooks. And this is because so far we only implemented local transforms. So we had our AST node representing class declaration and we only applied transform specific to these class declarations. Uh, but we can use Babel scope analysis uh, utilities to modify different parts of our AST, even if our visitor is only looking for class declarations, because we will need to inject an import uh, at the top level of our program. And this is because uh, if we had this input code and transform to this output code, it might seem like it's correct and our code demo did everything perfectly. But if we then try to run this output code, we will get an error like this. So we want to inject this import to use state from React. Okay, so how can we do that? Uh, well, we can build a utility function that starting from our class path, goes up to the program top level and then uh, looks for all the existing imports and finds the, the imports to React. So we can use this find parent utility to move up in the AST 
uh, until we find the program, where the program represents the whole file. Then we get the program, and in this case, I'm using uh, this. Okay, so program is a path, and I'm using this program.get so that I still have a path as a result. And I want a path because then we will need to modify the, the React import at the new state. Okay, so I'm filtering all the elements inside of the body to only get the import declarations. And then I'm only, I only want the import declaration uh, importing React. So it, it's possible that we already have a React import, and so I can just return this path that we just found. But what if we do not have a React import in our code? Well, in this case, we can use another of all the different AST manipulation utilities. In this case, it's unshift container, which is like uh, push or unshift for normal arrays. So our program has a body property, which is an array, and we are injecting the, an import to, to React. And then we are returning this new element that we just injected. OK, so again, you might see that we always work with paths and not with nodes. And this is because not only paths gives us a lot of utilities to move around the SD or to analyze the scope, but also this because Babel needs to, to be aware of the changes that you're doing to, to the ASD so that it can update all the metadata that it's collecting. And if you directly modify the ASD object, Babel does not, like we, Babel does not have a way of knowing that unless we, for example, clone the ASD every time and then every time compare the, the modified ASD with the original one. And using all of those get fu uh, functions on the AST to modify it, uh, the path on the paths to modify the ST, for example, unshift container, Babel can be notified that something is changing and it can update all its metadata and scope information accordingly. So we now have this find graph import function and we can use that in our class declaration visitor. So First, we transform the class to a normal, uh, well, normal. First, we transform the class to an arrow function. And then, uh, if we have any use state calls injected, we can find the React import path. And remember that this will either return an existing import or it will inject a new import, a new import to the React library. Uh, and then we have to add use state to this import. So in this case, we are not trying to, to understand what is the AST of the input code, but we can still use AST Explorer to check what is the AST that we want to build. And we need to do this now, and we cannot just use Babel template because Babel template is good at building uh, complete statements or complete expressions, while here we only want to build the use state part. We do not want to build the wall import declaration because we already had this import React. And since we only want to build part of a node, we cannot use Babel template directly, but we need to use Babel types. So we can see that our import declaration has an import specifier uh, that has an imported and local identifier. And both of them are use state. So why there is two times use state, even if the input code, it was only once? And this is because this is the same as doing import use state as use state. And so, well, we need to build two, two of them because our code might have an import alias, for example. So uh, let's go back to our find draft import and we can push this new specifier uh, that we can build uh, using the Babel types utilities to like t.import specifier, passing them the local and the imported names. And so, and also we only want to do this if there isn't already use state in our program. Uh, because if, for example, we have two components in a single file, 
we transform the first one and we inject U state. And then when transforming the second one, we do not want to inject a second import to use state. Uh, otherwise, JavaScript will throw above the duplicate use state declaration. So we can use Babel scope utilities to check if there is already a use state variable declared somewhere in our program. And if there is, we assume that it's the, the correct one added um, and we do not need to inject a new one. So now our codemon correctly transforms this input code to this output code, which is now correct and it should work. So, well, this is the end of our example, which is quite complex. It was, I mean, it was a really long example, but I still want to show you one more thing, which is what other tools we need to build codemon with Babel. And this is because Babel was born not as a refactoring tool, even if you can use that as a refactoring tool, and many people are doing that successfully. But Babel alone is simply not enough. And this is because Babel is great at doing two things, which is parsing JavaScript, supporting almost every new proposal or language extension, such as Flow or JSX. And it's also really good at providing tools to transform the, the AST. Uh, however, in order to build codemons, we also need a way to print the resulting AST, keeping the original formatting. And this is because Babel, uh, since the usual Babel output, when used as a build tool, is not uh, meant to be directly used by developers, but usually it's just sent to the browser as is. Babel does not really care about the code formatting, while for codemons, we might want to, to keep the original one. We do not want to reformat all of our files. And also, we need a way to run Babel plugin on different files. And well, actually, Babel can do this using, for example, Babel CLI, but Babel usually does this by creating a new output folder with the new files. And we need a way to modify them in place. Okay, so in order to do this, we can use other tools such as Prater, uh, which is at the, the code formatter. So we can let Babel print its ugly output and then use Prater to reformat it. Or we can use Recast, which is based on different goals. So Recast checks the original formatting of your, of your code and when generating the output code transformed by Babel, it prints the output code using the original formatting. And this is what JS Code Shift uses. And we, as the tool to run Babel on different files, we can either use JS Code Shift itself because JS Code Shift is, I mean, focuses on codemods and has a really good API. And we can use Babel plugins instead of just code shift to transform our code. Or we can use like a manual for loop that iterates over the files. And this is what I usually do when I'm building a codemod just for myself so that I do not need to create, for example, a nice interface for other users. Okay. So we have finished build our codemod. We saw what other tools we need. And we can see if it works in practice. So I've prepared this demo project. It's on GitHub and you can check it out yourself. But let's see how it does. So, OK, I have this repository where I have two main folders, one containing the codemod and one containing the an example of application that we're going to transform. And it's the React example, the React to do example I got from the to do MVC repository. So you can see here that we have the code demo that we built with during our slides. And it's just that it's now everything together. And I added a few new features that I didn't explain in the slides because they're almost the same of uh, the existing like use state transforms. Uh, and one is that I transform it component it mount and component it amount to use effort calls. And then I added a bunch of warnings for uh, for the when there was a this that the codemod was not able to transform. 
and the the example app that I'm going to transform is a TypeScript application using class components. Uh, and you can see that here it's using uh, not arrow functions, but normal class methods. And so I had to adapt a bit the code demo to work with this. Okay, so let's see uh, how our app look before uh, running the code demo. So I'm going to build it. Okay. And by the way, there is a readme on the repository explaining these steps if you want to do to, to run that by yourself. Okay. And no crash. Okay, so our app is a to-do list where we can add some items, we can mark some items are done, and we can filter what we're showing. Okay, so you now saw how this this app works, and we can try running the code demo. So, okay. And for my code demo, I created a small runner uh, that basically takes all the files that we want to transform as input and iterates over the files, calling recast and bubble over each of them. So I can run this code demo over the files inside of our to do mvc js folder. Okay, and VS Code is now showing me that some, fi some files had changes. And we can see that our code demo did something. So for example, we had our class component and it has now been transformed to an arrow function. We had some state here and it has been transformed to, to calls to the use state hook and so on. But does this work? Well, first, we, we have to check if there is any warning in the generated code, any warning comment. And there are a bunch of these. Uh, for example, this event handler was using this.refs that our code demo does not support. And so it injected this warning, and I now have to manually edit this. And in this case, it was just using this uh, ref to get the event target. So I can just replace it with event.target. And so as you can see, our code demo did a lot of work, but we still need to manually edit something. And I mean, this is okay. It will take me just a few minutes to fix this rather than maybe an hour to refactor the wall up. Okay, so since I removed the ref here, I also have to remove it from here, which was the ref where the it was the, where the ref was declared. And let's see if there is any remaining warning. So yes. And again, in this case, that was this this dot set state, uh, but it wasn't calling that, so our code demo was not able to transform it. And but since this code was just binding the set state uh, function uh, to this now showing object, uh, which is a state variable, and our code demo injected this set now showing and now showing uh, getter and setter for our state. So we can just reuse that, uh, call those function rather than doing as this complex binding stuff. So I can use set now showing in this case it's of all to do's. And I can do the same for the other two lines. Okay, and I can remove this since we do not need it anymore. Let's see if there is any other warning. Yes, and in this case, uh, it because it was binding some, it was binding some class properties because uh, I mean you know that when you have a method and you are pass passing that to another component, you need to en ensure that it has the correct this. But since in our case we we're using normal variables for functions and not class methods. We do not need to bind them to this, so we can just bind them to not. 
Okay, so let's see if there is any other warning. And no, so this should work now. Uh, you, uh, we still have two warnings, but they are in the codemod code, so we do not need to worry about them. And we can now go back to our, so let's see how our final app has been transformed. So all the classes has been transformed to our functions and the state to use state books and the class methods to inline variables. So we can now go back to the to do and see app, which has been modified. We can build it again. Okay, and we can now see if it works. Let me refresh. Okay, so it seems that our app is now working and it still does its things. And it still, I mean, it still works. And we can see that it's now using our functions, of, not only in these input files, but it's really serving our functions in the final bundle uh, because we can see that we do not have the, how it was called, for example, we do not have a class to do app anymore in the final bundle. But if we look for to do app, it's now an arrow function even in the bundle uh, sent to the browser. So, so yes, we transformed that and it's still, it's still working. So our codemo correctly did its thing and I mean, it managed to correctly refactor our app. So, well, that's all. Thanks for listening to me. And again, if you have any question, uh, you can contact me on Twitter or by email, as you prefer. I mean, we also have the, the discussion zone now. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much. Uh, that was an amazing talk and really interesting. So, so easier by making refactoring easier. So thanks a lot. Uh, we seem to have a little time here, but one of the bigger requests that we've got was actually about your dog. Uh, so would you mind showing us your dog? Uh, sure. Yay. It's sleeping there. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. So yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, I, I wonder, Misha, do you have any questions? I mean, I do have some questions from the audience. And Ilya Lesik uh, is asking about generating code from a design uh, via Babel. Some, um, some, you know, this like you have Figma and you have API to this Figma uh, stuff. And basically you can read this API, read the uh, you know, like rectangles and SVGs and stuff. And after that, generate uh, the, the existing code. And in, I don't know, like React components or something like this. And he wonders if he can use Babel uh, for this kind of stuff. So somehow map the, the object models that Figma uses to the AST, I guess, and then basically produce uh, the code via yeah. Babel. Okay, so uh well you could use some parts of babel for this uh the main problem i see is that babel takes an input code or an existing input ast so babel as a whole does not work because you do not have an input ast however you could use some utilities from babel such as babel template babel parser to to build the code corresponding to your model and then you can either use babel generator or something like prettier to print the resulting ast but Babel one or the main parts of Babel are probably not the, the correct tool for this. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. Also, I wonder um, how important is to have like a proper test before you run this code modes, like unit tests, integration okay. tests, or like any kind of tests. Yeah, so, okay, so, well, first of all, there are two different Type, two different 
well, type of tests for codemods. And one is that you can directly test your codemod. And another one is that you need to have tests in our app, in your app, to, to be sure that the codemod isn't breaking anything. Uh, so in the demo I was showing before, we had a really small app. And so, I mean, we could just manually verify in the browser that it was working. While, well, this is not the case for real-world apps, which are usually way bigger. And I mean, a part of the test for the codemo, because you can have some basic, uh, like snapshot testing with some basic input codes and checking that the output code makes sense. But the problem is that with this, you will never uh, like test every possible edge case that can appear in real-world code. Uh, so what I think is the best is to have tests for your app. And even if you do not have tests for your whole app, but just for some parts of them, for example, for some components or for some pages, I mean, it's not the same thing as having tests for everything. But if you run the code demo on those parts of your code base that are tested, and if you, if you then run your test and see that your code demo didn't break them, you could have some pretty good confidence that it's not going to break the other pages without tests. And, but for this, it's important that your tests in your app are not testing the, inter the internal uh, like implementation details of your code. For example, in the React case, your, if your tests are, for example, directly calling a function on the, on the class component, which is usually just an internal, an internal implementation detail of they are, for example, uh, I don't know, calling the, like creating a React component using new name of the component and then checking the, and then manually calling the render method. Those tests are going to break. But if you only test uh, like the component as a wall without testing the internal design, then they will still work when running your codemo because codemo's I mean, when refactoring your code, you are modifying everything except for the public interface, and that's the same for codemos. So, I mean, as long as you are only testing the public interface for the functions or for the what you can consider as a unit of your program, codemos uh, are still going, like your tests are still going to work after running the codemo, and they will still have a lot of value in making sure that nothing is broken. Oh, wow, that that was insightful. Um, <laughs> maybe Vishval have some questions. Yeah, uh, th that was that was great. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you personally, uh, this is this is just a me question, was that of course you're involved in Babel uh, uh, so much, but you're also working on DC thirty nine stuff, and I mean of course a lot of Babel is making various plugins. To to make sure that the that the new things that are supported by TC39 actually work in Babel, which is great. The way that our talk, as I told you before, I, I didn't know about good and uh, they were interesting to me uh, in a way that I want to ask you: Do you think uh, TC39 moving forward? Should maybe invest or, or maybe look deeper into code mods, right? So we have been, for example, working on the temporal proposal. So maybe we could make a code mod to just automatically, you know, use temporal instead of moment throughout your code base, and and that that seems to be an interesting case. What do you think? Yes, I think that this could really help driving the adoption of new features because. Uh, like the main reason for not adopting new features is that you already have code that is working with the old, the like the the old equivalents. For example, with moments instead of temporal, and there isn't really a reason to change. But if it was really simple, just running a code demo, I think many more people would try running new proposal or new ECMAScript features. And there are already some code demos doing that, mostly for syntax. For example, I mentioned that we run a code demo on our own code base to remove uh, unused catch uh, bindings uh, because in some version of, of ECMAScript they became optional. 
And also there was a tool a few years ago, which was called, I think it was Lebab, which is like if you read Bubble, but starting from the end, which was doing the opposite of what Bubble usually does. So it was taking some uh, code written like in ES5 and converting that to ES6 code. So yeah, someone already tried to do that. And I think that it's a really good idea to help driving the adoption of new proposals. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds amazing. Thank you. Uh, on, on perhaps a more, now that you've been so nerdy about things, I guess, maybe we could ask on a more personal front. Uh, your dog is awake. Uh, that's always a great thing. Uh, yeah, so you, you've been working on Babel and for DC39 time at this point. Uh, and you've worked on some of the more interesting features, especially talking of syntax based uh, stuff. Uh, you know, some really cool things have happened recently. What do you think would be your favorite change in the in the more recent years? Uh, in the future or in the past? Like for the next proposal or for what already happened? Well, maybe we can do both. So okay, so well, for what already happened, I'm really loving optional chaining, which I mean, it's probably what many other people would say, so it's not surprising, but it really simplified a lot of pieces in our code base. And for the for the future, the proposal that I'm looking forward most more for are is the pipeline operator. But it will probably take a lot of year before we have the, that proposal. I think it's stage one or stage two now. And also, I'm looking at decorators, uh, which is probably the proposal that had a, a more complex history. And it, we probably now yeah, have the, the most fourth version of decorators. Yeah. And the decorators are how I started contributing to this 39 helping with that proposal as part of my implementation in Babel. So I'm probably now looking, I think I will implement the new proposal version in Babel maybe like next year. That's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it looks like we're at the end of our time here, but we can proceed to the Zoom room. And Michael, take away. Yeah. Let's just, you know, uh, thanks, uh, say thanks uh, to Nicola and show our gratitude because it was a great talk in my opinion. And let's head out to the discussion zone. Hey, thanks. See you there. Thank you, guys. It was an amazing talk. I will... Thank you very much. And uh, guys, I want to mention if you w if you have some questions or you just want to chat with our uh, speaker and with our uh, experts, you can follow uh, the link and open Zoom and uh, do what you want. You have, I think, more than an hour. It's amazing. And uh, I don't know what to say, but actually I have, I have one question, but I, have, I think we're out of time and I will ask your Nicola personally after. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. It was an amazing talk. And bye-bye. Thank you. See bye. You.